So in many ways, this paper is actually a sequel to one that I and my co-authors published last year at DIS. In that paper, we reviewed literature on designing technologies to support reflection domains ranging from personal informatics to health to education. Uh, we saw a marked increase in the, the number of papers that were using reflection as a keyword. However, despite this increase, only about a third of those papers we reviewed actually defined the term reflection, even though they were using it as a keyword. And even fewer of them cited any kind of theoretical or conceptual grounding for that definition. Uh, Fleck and Fitzpatrick at OzChi 2010 noted a similar gap, pointing to the, quote, fuzziness in which the term reflection is used within the HCI community. This paper addresses that gap. <clears throat> To do so, it reviews conceptual and theoretical literature on reflection from a range of disciplines and traditions. It then describes, I'll then describe how the paper synthesizes across these bodies of literature to draw out three conceptual dimensions of reflection that could be useful to inform design. And finally, in the spirit of reflection, I'll conclude with some reflexive considerations about uh, how we approach the phenomenon of reflection in interaction design. So there's conceptual and theoretical frameworks for reflection that can be found in a variety of areas. Uh, this paper organizes that work not just in terms of the different disciplines from which it comes, but really moreover in terms of the epistemological traditions that they represent. Specifically, it considers work from four different approaches. Uh, work primarily in philosophy, work in cognitive science, work in education, and work involving critical approaches. Uh, the paper provides a literature review for each of these areas, but for the purposes of the talk, I'll just describe one or two exemplars from each of these traditions. First, one of the earlier explorations of reflection in, in Western intellectual tradition, at least, comes from Kant and his critique of the power of judgment. Judgment for Kant deals with assessments that we make about the world around us, how we weigh our experiences. And he distinguishes two types of judgment. The first, which he calls determinant judgment, answers the question, what kind of thing is this? Determinant judgment essentially attempts to interpret novel experiences in terms of categories and existing categories and classifications. Reflective judgment, on the other hand, occurs when novel experiences can't be made sense of with our existing interpretive schema. Thus, for Kant, Reflection is a process of restructuring the schema by which we interpret and make sense of the world. <clears throat> Second, in cognitive science, there are many dual process models of cognition that distinguish between, on the one hand, automatic or heuristic processes, and on the other hand, more conscious, intentional, and reflective modes of cognition. Uh, one example of a fairly fine-grained approach comes from developmental psychology, specifically King and Kitchener's model of reflective judgment. Uh, incidentally, they make no mention of Kant's concept by the same name. This model includes developing through seven different stages of thought from less reflective to more reflective. Across these various cognitive frameworks, reflection is characterized by intentional, non-automatic, deliberate cognition. Third, scholars in education have, re have explored how reflection might be beneficial for various aspects of learning. For example, uh, Donald Schoen famously analyzed what he termed reflective practitioners to understand the processes by which various professionals, uh, investment bankers, baseball pitchers, jazz musicians, city planners, understand how it is that they do what they do. Uh, he makes a distinction between reflection on action, which occurs post, post hoc, and reflection in action. That is, reflection that's intimately bound up with and inseparable from uh, action in the world. And so for Sean, reflection really involves the kinds of tacit learning that occur through the conduct of situated embodied doing. Finally, although it doesn't always use the term reflection, many critically oriented design approaches have similarly aligned goals. As Dunn and Raby put it, critical design, quote, asks carefully crafted questions and makes us think. Its purpose is to stimulate discussion and debate. 
we can see that this sensibility has a lot in common with the other, with the other approaches to reflection that I've described. As an example, Halmus and Redstrom's system Chatterbox, shown here, uh, pseudo-randomly splices together snippets of office emails. In doing so, it provides a different way of knowing what's going on in an office, challenging traditional approaches to office software that focus on efficiency and, and productivity. In general, critical approaches see knowledge as, as contingent upon and arising from particular historical circumstances and power structures in which that knowledge is created. And in many ways, critical design provides a means of drawing attention to those power dynamics and historical contingencies, as well as suggesting alternatives. So looking across these diverse perspectives, uh, we can see both differences and commonalities. In the paper, I discuss some of the differences between these approaches, but for the purpose of this talk, I'll really just focus on commonalities. And specifically, I want to describe three dimensions that, uh, that show up in various ways across these different traditions that may be useful in informing or inspiring designing for reflection. First, breakdown is really featured prominently in several conceptualizations of reflection. For instance, in Kant's account, reflective judgment occurs precisely when novel experiences don't fit with our existing conceptual schema. Uh, for Schoen, reflection occurs when there's some sort of puzzling, troubling, or interesting phenomenon that disrupts or problematizes the normal conduct of practice. One example of how this can be leveraged in design comes from Lindley et al., who suggests a, a speculative a speculative design proposal that they call shoddy pop. Uh, this is an email server that randomly delays the delivery of an email messages for an unpredictable amount of time. And they suggest that doing so uh, facilitates a breakdown of our normal expectations for email with respect to immediacy, thereby providing space and time for reflection on the content of the message. In general, Breakdown involves incorporating this kind of violation of expectations into design. Second, many frameworks of reflection involve conscious, intentional consideration or investigation of a situation. In many educational approaches, the, the process of reflection really involves closer examination of previously formed understandings. In King and Kitchener's model of reflective judgment, Reflection involves interrogating not only what one knows, but also how one knows it. One example of this, uh, of designing around inquiry, comes from a system called Considerate, developed by Kriplian et al. And Considerate was, was designed to help voters form opinions on and reflect about various ballot propositions. Importantly, the system distinguishes between statements that are made about an issue and arguments to support those statements. So in this way, having the, the arguments to support those statements really creates a separate space focused specifically on facilitating inquiry. Furthermore, as shown at the, the bottom of this, this screenshot, after reading these arguments, a user can also return to revise her or his original position. And this point leads to the third dimension, that ultimately, Reflection involves change. It's not just about examining the current state of things, but about envisioning alternatives. For example, in Kant's reflective judgment, ultimately it involves uh, transformation of the conceptual schema with which we interpret the world. Also, as I've described, the cognitive approaches distinguish between heuristic processes and reflective systems. Heuristic processes generally follow a set of prescribed rules, but reflective systems change the rules by which those heuristic systems operate. <clears throat> One example of transformation in design can be seen in the, the chatterbox system that I mentioned a moment ago. If you were to approach this system with a traditional office software focus on efficiency and productivity, the system becomes nearly incomprehensible. Chatterbox in some ways requires a transformation of the user's or the viewer's perspective in order to make any sense of it. So these examples show how 
each of the dimensions I've described might play out in design. <clears throat> in the spirit of, of reflection, I now want to take a, a reflexive turn on the paper itself. Specifically, I'll consider some of the assumptions underlying this work, examine the implications thereof, and offer some alternatives, that is, break down inquiry and transformation. First, the paper is in many ways predicated on the notion that reflective thinking is in fact valuable. And this isn't particularly exceptional. A similar commitment can be seen in much of the other work in HCI around designing for reflection. However, there may exist situations in which reflection is less appropriate or even harmful. For instance, a doctor at the operating table might benefit from Shunian style reflection in action on the operating procedures that she or he is performing. But the doctor may become distracted by reflection on, say, the economic or sociopolitical inequalities perpetuated by her or his country's healthcare system. Indeed, excessive reflection might result in a sort of paralysis by analysis that becomes deleterious to the conduct of normal daily practice. And so I'd suggest that research in this area may benefit from means of articulating such situations in, reflection become, in which reflection becomes potentially harmful. I also want to take a moment to consider some of the complexities involved in evaluating these systems designed to support reflection. Uh, for this talk, I'll just, I'll just touch on two points. First, asking if a system makes users more reflective seems a a potential reduction of a fairly complex phenomenon that, that might not get at what we actually want to know about reflection. Instead, one might ask, rather than how much reflection a system supports, one could ask what kinds of reflection. For example, one could use King and Kitchener's stage-based model or Fleck and Fitzpatrick's levels of reflection to look at the types of reflections that occur. But these frameworks are still couched in terms of being more or less reflective. As an alternative, the three dimensions that I've proposed here provide a potential evaluative framework. One could consider, for example, the specific instances that occasion breakdowns, the kinds of inquiring activities conducted, or the types of transformations that occur. This move from quantification of reflection to qualification can help us better grapple with the, the complexity of reflection. Second, traditional HCI often asks the question, did it work? Uh, in this context, that very quickly becomes, did users reflect? Did your system make users reflect? which almost inevitably requires assessment or reflection of, or assessment or measurement of reflection per se. As an alternative, we might think about evaluating these systems uh, not in terms of whether or not they make users more reflective, but rather as interventions in the, the process of reflection. Doing so moves reflection from a problem area in need of a solution to a situation where we want to understand the impacts of posing various kinds of interventions. Thus, this approach can open opportunities to deepen our understanding both of the phenomenon of reflection itself and of the impacts of our designs. So, to reiterate, this paper fills a, a noted gap in the HCI literature. By reviewing reflection from a variety of epistemological traditions, it provides a vocabulary for articulating what exactly reflection is, and implicitly what it is not, as well as how we might go about designing around reflection. Importantly, the paper doesn't advocate for one or another single perspective on reflection. Conceptualizations in areas from cognitive science to philosophy to education can all beneficially inform design. Also, I don't want to suggest that the three dimensions I've, I've articulated here represent a final list of how to design for reflection. Rather, the paper is meant as a statement to advance our discourse in this area. Work on designing and evaluating systems to support reflection should try deploying these dimensions to examine which are helpful, which need revision, and what other dimensions we might want to consider. So by providing this shared vocabulary, 
We can enable productive dialogue among the various application areas where designers have sought to support reflection from personal informatics to education to workplace collaboration to social relationships. This paper provides the conceptual and theoretical grounding to support those conversations and advance our work around designing for reflection. Uh, really quick, I want to thank the NSF for supporting this work, the Flickr users who shared their photos, uh, my colleagues and the anonymous reviewers providing valuable feedback, and all of you for your time and attention. So thank you, Eric. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, again, the microphones in the room. Hi, I'm Chris Elston, I'm coach of Newcastle University. Um, thanks a lot for the, the paper. I think it'll be very useful. Thanks. And from what I'm really understanding, one thing that appears to me perhaps missing though is that we sometimes do a lot of reflection and sometimes it's more productive than others but there might be moments of breakthrough or, or reflection that particularly gives us a new form of transformative under understanding, as you say. I just wondered if you came across um, any sort of perspectives on that, on that moment of breakthrough, which might be what we're trying to design for, perhaps. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, looking at the, the theoretical literature on reflection, it's not often described as this kind of heterogeneous process where you have moments of mulling through and then there's the sudden burst of a, of a breakthrough. I think it could be really interesting, especially if what you're looking at is trying to design for reflection, thinking about, um, it's tempting to say, how do you design for those moments of breakthrough or how do you make those moments of breakthrough happen? But I think it would be just as, just as valuable to design for those other more mundane moments of reflection where you don't feel like you're necessarily advancing your understanding, but there may be subconscious or unconscious productive work that's being done there. So yeah, there's, there's definitely some opportunities there. So Ron Wilkar, Simon Fraser University. Um, so thank you, I'm just, so you, 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 you mentioned, I mean, you, you gave us three, three dimensions of re reflection, and you mentioned, of course, that this is open and more, perhaps, uh, could be added to, or, or further refinements. I'm just curious if you could actually, if, I mean, if you yourself have thought about that, and what you might want to share with us. Yeah, so, so one of the things that, that I think is interesting, um, and that I think Chris's question alludes to a little bit, is the temporality of reflection. Um, so, so there's uh, the example from Lindley et al., the, the shoddy pop system that delays delivery of emails to try to make space for reflection. It does it by making time for reflection to give you more, essentially, time to think and reflect. Um, there's interesting literature from, uh, again, the behavioral economics tradition looking at uh, decision processes and when the reflective system have, or comes into play versus the heuristic system. And I think some kind of dimension around temporality could be really useful in terms of informing design and how do we make that time to have reflection. <laughs> 